This is Dr. David Proden, and I want to thank you as we begin another journey into school and community safety. If you're looking for industrial safety expert, Appalachian State University professor, Dr. Timothy Ludwig, please visit www.safety-doc.com. Again, that's Dr. Timothy Ludwig at www.safety-doc.com. Dot com. Welcome to the Safety Doc Podcast with author, radio host, and nationally recognized safety expert, Dr. David Perotti. Join us each week as we discuss the best and most bizarre practices in safety preparation and crisis response. Follow Dr. Perodin on Twitter at SafetyPhD. And remember, the truth will keep you safe. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. David Perodin. And welcome to this episode of the Safety Doc Podcast. Harris must learn from Citicorp's Towers' fatal flaw. More about that in just a moment. So... At the School for the Blind, I was working with an adult student. So he is 18 years old, and in order to go to the dorm, you need to have a staff member go with you. So the student said, I, I want to stop at the dorm um, before I meet with you, and then I can obtain some change for the vending machine and get like a Pepsi or something like that. So I meet him at the entrance to the dorms. We go in and he's looking for, I think, headphones and some things that he has to kind of gather up. The students stay there during the week and then they go home on the weekends. And this was on a Friday. So he was gathering up some things and he said, could you find 50 cents on my dresser um, so I can grab a soda from the lounge on my way down? I said, yeah, yeah, I, I can do that. So I look, and he's got change all over his dresser, and I pull over two quarters, and they're very shiny, so I'm thinking, yeah, must have just got these. You know, there's all these different commemorative quarters for the states and things like that. So I said, yeah, they're on the corner of your, your dresser. So he takes them, and we go down to the lounge and gets to the vending machine, and he knows that uh, 54 will get him a Pepsi. So he puts in the two quarters and, and they come back out. So I'm like, well, that's odd. Um, so he tries again. And then he tries again. And uh, and then he said, is there anything up with these quarters? And I said, I don't, they're shiny. I'm like, maybe there's some new commemorative or, you know, so I, I don't know. So... He, one more time, puts the quarters in, and, and they just come right back out, the change return. And then he starts to examine these quarters a little bit, and he said, he said, hey, Dr. P, these uh, these aren't quarters. These are bus tokens, okay? And I'm like, so I look at them, and I'm like, yeah, I guess it is a bus token. It's a bus token which has 98% similarity to a quarter, <laughs> So just crazy. Um, and I said, does this, does this happen a lot? Do you confuse these things? And he said, yeah. And actually, I talked to some other staff, and they said, oh, you wouldn't believe how many of these things end up like in the vending machines. So then I'm digging a little bit deeper, and I'm having this conversation with this adult student. Again, I mean, part of his day is off campus. He's taking some college courses and working, and basically his – life right now is learning uh, orientation and mobility skills or how to use a cane in, in different bus routes. He had lost his vision um, about five years ago, so he had vision up until then. So he's, he's learning these skills. Terrific, terrific kid. Uh, so we get into this conversation. I said, you know, the School for the Blind has been in this community for 150 years, and this community um, has chosen to use a token for its bus route, which is virtually identical. Remember, I said there is no sameness, but I mean, it, it basically is a quarter. 
so why would you not design <laughs> this thing to be different? Or if you were purchasing like your bus token system, right? From your manufacturer, you'd say, we have a high population of visually impaired or blind people in our community who either live here, work here, or go to school here. And it's been that way for like 150 years. Um, and wouldn't you want those people to be part of um, testing these things out before you adopt these? <laughs> so it is this whole process of looking at this thinking, who, at, at what level did, did, did this get approved? Why didn't somebody say, you know what, we our, we, we have a community here which has the School for the Blind for the entire state for 150 years. A number of people that work in our community are visually impaired or blind. Uh, maybe we shouldn't make the bus token so it looks and feels virtually identical to a quarter. Maybe it's just me. But when I heard from other staff that, yeah, we're pulling these things out of like vending machines nonstop and the students are saying, yeah, it's like, you know, to try to distinguish these things. But then I shared with the student, I said, you know, as bad as this is, you did not have to live through the Susan B. Anthony um, dollar coin era, which I did when I was back in college. I said, that was, and and so he's like, what, what was it? I'm like, it's a dollar coin. Like they don't make them anymore. I'm like, they were horrendous. It was this whole thing of trying to get rid of the dollar bill. And I remember they had vending machines at grocery stores when I was in college. And that's how you'd get your stamps. Or you could do the vending machine thing at the post office too, although that seems kind of ridiculous unless the line's really long. But you'd put in like, you know, 5 or $10. I don't know what postage was back then. And you'd get your, your stamps. And it would give you a change, but it would use the Susan B. Anthony dollars because like – Nobody wanted these things. So that was like the way to disperse them. So as soon as you heard the, the little ding, 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 ding come down, it's like you unfortunately won at the casino. But what's coming out, it's not quarters. It's Susan B. Anthony do, you know, dollars here from the stamp vending machine. And those things were impossible to get rid of. Like, right, you, you, you couldn't convince somebody – if you're using those as currency, you're even going through a grocery store. It's like, no, seriously, like this is $7. Like these, these aren't like, you know, arcade tokens or anything like that. These are actually dollars. They were the, they were weird shape, like what, like an octagon kind of is bigger than a 50 cent. I don't know. I don't remember. I just kind of block that out of my mind. Um, but thankfully those things like got out of circulation. Um, so, Hey, our previous, podcast, um, I talked about the Notre Dame cathedrals after the fire and um, how lead vaporizes at 752 degrees Fahrenheit. The fire was 2,000 degrees. So we have 500,000 pounds of lead on the roof, most of it vaporized. So you know, my statement was this is this is a significant health issue, right? We we have massive lead contamination that has occurred not only at the cathedral but proximal to the cathedral, and you just gotta follow that plume of smoke, right? That heavy, thick smoke, and figure out where that went and cooled, and then descend it upon every rooftop and you know people's cars and lawn and just waterways and just everything. So, um, and this is turning out to be true. I completely believe, I completely believe Notre Dame will not be rebuilt. That the billion dollars which have been um, donated for the rebuilding, the restoration, restoring, whatever, um, that's a loan in, in lead abatement. It's going to cost you more than that. So I'm convinced there will be a point in the next few months when there'll need to be a statement of saying, here's the deal, like, here's what the lead abatement is going to cost us, not only for the cathedral, but then, like, you'd have some obligation, right, <laughs> to proximal areas or where this plume of, of smoke um, eventually cooled and all of this lead dust came down. You'd have some responsibility for that, I would think, you know, legally, I guess. So per The Guardian... In an article dated May 9th, okay, here we go. 
The Paris police statement on Thursday said that on the surface of pavements and gardens immediately adjoining the cathedral, lead levels were found to be very high, between 32 and 65 times the recommended limit by French health authorities. Ah, remember, um, I believe it's the World Health Organization said there's no safe level of lead. So, all right, so they're saying French authorities saying it's very high. It's between 32 and 65 times the recommended limit. Yeah, that's that is very high, right? That's like, and, and the fact is the neurological damage that happens when you have lead in your system. You know, just from kids eating some lead paint or lead leaching out of pipes. But so yeah, this is significant, right? The areas closest to the cathedral are currently closed. Lead levels are also high within the cathedral itself. Yeah. Get a little more specific on that. Definitely high. Everything in there obviously is contaminated. And you would have had some lead that would have actually melted into the cathedral. And I understand how the roof system works and there's the roof underneath the roof and all that. But you still would have had massive amounts that would have come into that into that building. So, But people are starting to raise some red flags on this. And, and I made several posts saying this is going to be... Uh, an issue that is on par with Chernobyl. Um, I, again, and I believe that from a response that you're, you're going to have to look at something very um, significant from a, a health preservation perspective. Um, so there are different groups which are acknowledging and, and bringing up discourse on this now. So here, here's one. Um, the French environmental campaign group, Robin de Bois, has warned that over 300 tons of lead from the cathedral's, cathedral's roof and steeple had melted in the place. Actually, probably had vaporized, right? The cathedral has been reduced to the state of toxic waste, the association said shortly after the fire, urging authorities to detoxify the tons of rubble, ash, and wastewater produced in the disaster. The group will, on Friday, reiterate its concerns over health risk from the blaze and possible contamination of the sun, or sign, sign river, right, right next to it. Since the fire, the police have maintained that the threat from lead was limited. So, like, why are the police saying this? This is really your scientists, right? This is your public health organization. It's not your police to say, like, you have safe levels of lead. It's your health organization, but, okay. Um... So that police are saying threat from lead was limited, saying lead poisoning usually builds up over years of exposure. Not really, right? <laughs> Not if it's right there and you are consuming it. Um, it is through the you know water that you are drinking from um, exposure that it's getting into your clothes. It's you're breathing it in. Um, it's every time a vehicle passes, you know, somebody's out on a lawn, some winds whip up, something gets pulled out of a, a, a off of a roof, off of a gutter. So, no, that's that's you know not accurate, right? Saying lead poisoning usually builds up over years of exposure, so it's still going to be there for years, right? Um, there have been no reports of acute lead poisoning since the blaze that destroyed the roof of the 850 year old landmark. Acute, well, probably accurate statement, right? It's going to take a little more than three weeks for this to show up. Um, but here are, here's some of the things <laughs> that have bothered me. So again, in my podcast, you know, which I recorded on the 28th of April, I stated the toxic levels of lead and lead abatement would be huge technical and public health issues for years and decades to come for the cathedral in the proximal area, and that you need to track the plume of smoke, that you need to identify the people in that entire region. Remember, you know, Paris, 3.3 million people. And I kind of mapped that out. I'm thinking maybe like a million people affect it. Um, But wouldn't you, so, so you might not see um, a spike in in lead content in people's blood or lead saturation in blood draws um, for people who live right next to, you know, within a block of the cathedral because the plume of smoke, 
you know, was up several hundred feet and probably would have traveled a couple miles before it was cooled and before it would have descended. So it's probably that, you know, two, three miles out range of following the plume that you're going to suddenly see people showing um, lead toxicity and symptoms of that. So here's another part. So why why wouldn't you test the thousands of people like for free as as your public health? Why would you not test everybody for their um, lead uh, saturation in their blood? So how much lead they have in their blood? Anybody who lives, you know, maybe in Paris and, and that you just make this available as a public health testing. Why would you not do that immediately, like right now? And you could definitely identify if you had areas that were high. And at the other part, you would identify a baseline. Now, it's not a true baseline because you don't have a whole large sample of blood tests um, before this happened, you know, from this geographic area. But you could at least say, we're going to test, and then we're going to test, you know, again in three months, and we're going to test again in three months, and these are all free. So wouldn't you want to do that, right? Wouldn't you want to find out um, if this plume, if this area proximal to the cathedral, what the immediate effects were, and then what the long-term effects are? So, but there's reasons not to do that, right? (laughs) We'll get into those in a moment. A must read for parents, teachers, and taxpayers. Dr. David Perodin has written the most honest book about the $3 billion school safety industrial complex. Attorney James Sibley proclaims A brave demonstration of speaking truth to power. School of Errors rips the lid off the billion dollar school safety industry. Using real-world examples of successful responses in desperate situations, David contrasts the expensive window dressings pitched to panic parents with the inexpensive and effective approaches proven to actually work. Read this book before you let your school waste another precious dollar on meaningless safety theater. Buy the international bestseller, School of Errors, Rethinking School Safety in America, now at Barnes & Noble or Amazon. So, um, so if, if, if this lead, if this lead ab- abatement also isn't feasible, so if, if they look at the cathedral and they're saying, you know, are you kidding me? Like a billion dollars to just get the lead out of this? We can't do that. It's like four billion just to get the lead out of this and before we can start on anything. You know, it's like almost a super fun site. What do you do with, with the billion dollars? And what do you do if you start testing people for how much lead they have in their blood? And, and people then are saying, you know, they're having symptoms, illnesses which are related um, to uh, lead contamination, lead poisoning. Do they have access then to this billion dollars which has been donated? Is there some type of class action suit that happens? Can the donors take this money back and say, well, you know, we only earmarked it for restoration of the cathedral. And now that you're trying to get it to pay for your medical bills, nope, we're not doing that. So it's massive. It's this massive consideration which is going on right now. So if 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 this was um, genuinely identified as a health risk, meaning that, um, which it should be, right? But if you are saying we are testing, you know, we are making tests available to everybody in Paris. You know, you can come in and get a blood test and we'll let you know what it is. And you can come back in, you know, three months after that and take another test. How do you, some things, like how do you treat that? Like how do you, with your health co- healthcare resources, how do you, how do you manage that? Um, literally, you could have thousands of people that you would need to be treating Um, What does that look like? Who pays for that? And also, let's talk about, you know, very open President Macron. Um, You know, tourism is the lifeblood of Paris and is the lifeblood of Notre Dame. And and it's like, well, yeah, you're not going to have a robust 
tourism economy if you have lead contamination, which is publicly known, um, and people are questioning, you know, hey, like how much has really gotten into the soil? How much every time it rains is leaching out? Um, what's the lasting effect for like livestock? You know, if this has gone out of the area as people come in and out of the city, what? How how is this lead being moved? How is it being then reabsorbed back into the environment? We're talking again five hundred thousand pounds of lead that were vaporized. So um, if you wipe out tourism, you wipe out the economy of Paris just flat out, and then you take a big hit to France. So there's much incentive to not do that, right? I'm not saying it's ethical. I'm just saying there's much incentive to not do that. Many articles I read also um, were uh, indicating that with with the cathedral being closed, you know, the the concern was what are we going to do because we get so much money from tourism, especially like from the United States. So what if this you know area? We just don't have the tourists coming down. What is this going to look like for the next five, six years? So you definitely have that sense that um, if anything significant came out saying, yeah, there is a massive lead abatement project that has to be undertaken. It's going to take, you know, years, decades. And and the point is in the cathedral really, no. I mean, we're not going to be able to rebuild it. I don't know what the plan is there. We'll preserve part of it, or it's just not going to be, we just can't do this. It's just not feasible. So again, you have tourism affected, which in turn affects your economy. You have a, a big demand on your healthcare resources, and you also open up litigation. Again, thousands of people who are testing high for um, lead in their blood, and if those saturation levels go up, and what do you do for treating them? Um and then do they have some access uh, to this billion dollars which has been pledged or a, you know lawsuit against um, the city of Paris or against you know France because the um, you know the the roof was was a liability how does this all work or or to get in this big long drawn out legal battle of was it really causal well you can probably get that right because you could match the the lead up um, through forensics and you could also look at the plume and, and pretty definitely identify like well here's where the plume was we, we know where that went um, and then you know if you have your high percentage right where that plume was of persons with lead poisoning so this is just a mess again folks I am saying the the government of France is not being upfront with this there is much incentive to not be upfront with this, but perhaps they are addressing this. It's just in a way that they don't want to um, panic, you know, the the population because it's so dense. I mean, if you come out and say, "Listen, like a million people have been exposed exposed to potentially toxic, or at the very least." Um, levels of lead which could impact um, you know their life functioning temporarily or permanently how do you deal with that i mean it's frightening right it's terrifying so can you really say that can you really admit to that but then so how do you how do you measure what's going on how do you do this behind the scenes to try to mitigate this so that's where this story is going to go and a different direction in just a minute because I'm going to talk about the 1977 uh, City Corps uh, tower and a fatal flaw that was discovered in the tower in the way that the engineer responded to that and then also with the city as a way to to deal with that and and something that could have had a ramification on you know maybe 20,000 people as far as like you know losing their lives being uh, severely injured. So uh, we're going to get to that in just a moment. So this is really a question of ethics, what's happening right now in France, what's happening in Paris. But at some point, I just don't think you're going to be able to keep a lid on this because you already have many groups um, who are starting to ask and, and push the questions of, 
what's the deal with the health risk? Where's the baseline on this? Um, again, if you have between 32 and 65 times recommended limit of lead, um, and you know, again, lead is an element, lead is an element. So, you know, the wood that would have burned or did burn, um, that just, you know, convert it to light and convert it to, to heat and, you know, some particles vapor pretty much gone and carbon. And, you know, you don't have to worry about that, but, you know, lead just changes form. So it, it just went into the vaporized form and some of it also melted. So again, because it is an element, it's still existing out there. And that is a lot of lead um, in their environment. So to think that this is just going to quickly go by the wayside simply isn't going to happen. So let's move on here on the old Safety Doc podcast. And so this article is from Slate, and it is by Joel Werner. All right, so we're going to talk about the City Corp tower. So this was built in 1977. Um, I did listen to a presentation by the chief structural engineer, William Lemazur. He had given this presentation in 1997, the one I had listened to 20 years after the, the, the um, city Corp, or city Corp tower was built. And, uh, he basically, you know, he was completely honest in that in in that presentation, and it was an amazing point also of honesty when it, when a mistake was made and something that I think the Paris officials can learn from. And not saying what happened in 1977, I identified all of the correct steps to take, but there were many steps taken which uh, were correct in responding to a significant situation. So let's get into it. So, when it was built in 1977, Citicorp Center, later renamed Citigroup Center, now called 601 Lexington anyway, um, was at 59 stories, the seventh tallest building in the world. You can pick it out from the New York City skyline by its 45 degree angle top. But it's the base of the building that really makes the tower so unique. The bottom nine of its 59 stories are stilts. Uh, this thing does not look sturdy, but it has to be th sturdy. Otherwise, they wouldn't have built it this way, right? So basically, the stilts, instead of being in the corners of the building, they had just shifted them so they were kind of in the center. So imagine um, they just get moved in. So you can look at an image of the building, and, and you'll, you'll totally know what I'm talking about. Um, the architect of Citicorp Center was Hugh Stubbins, but most of the credit for the building is given to its chief structural engineer, William Le Mazur. The design originated with the need to accommodate St. Peter's Lutheran Church, which occupied one corner of the building site. So basically, there was a Lutheran church, and it was pretty run down and old, but the owners of the church, the parish, didn't want to give up the church. So they said, we will give you the rights to the air above the church, but not the church itself. The problem with that was that in order to build the building, one of the pillars to support it would have come down right on the church and destroyed it. So actually what happened was that they designed, they, they moved the pillars. So they were in the center of each wall, each side. And that preserved in the corner where you had this, this church. Having stilts in the middle of each side made the building less stable. So the Mazur designed a chevron bracing structure, rows of eight-story Vs. So think of a V, basically kind of like a pine tree where the branches go up in, in, in a V from each side from the center of the, of the tree. Um, that they would they go up to support the the branches go up and then of course that's what it that's what it looks like so very much similar to like a pine tree so and it worked the chevron bracing system made the building exceptionally light and there was also a tuned mass damper it was a 400 ton device it kept the building stable so here's the deal with the tuned 
um, the, the tuned damper. So it was electrically operated and it was in and of itself an engineering feat that hadn't been seen before that time. Uh, was developed in Minnesota by an engineering firm. And what it did is, and, and, and after that, it was replicated like over 100 times in Japanese um, sk uh, skyscrapers because it responds very well to not only hurricanes, but if there are earthquakes, in limiting the sway of the, the building, of doing a counter for the sway. So this damper was exceptional. And as uh, Le Mazur said, um, you know, this this would really allow the building to withstand 150 like to 200 mile an hour winds if it was operating. Um, so really ingenious, cutting edge. Um, but here's the problem that happened. So it was 1978. So it's a year after the, the structure um, opens up and... Um, According to Le Mazur, uh, the, the chief engineer of the building, he, he gets a call, okay, from an undergraduate architecture student. And the student is, is studying this um, structure, was assigned to study this in a class, and says, you know, I, I'm amazed at your design because when I look at it, I just don't understand how the building can withstand wind forces. Um, so the the it was you know explained by by you know Le Mazur. Here's how we designed it. Here's how we strengthened you know the building and, and all of that. Um, so the the student and and we don't know who the student is. Like we don't have a name. And back then it's you know the he it was just a phone call. Actually, Le Mazur called the student back to have a further discussion, but didn't you know have the number, you don't have caller ID. It's not like today where you'd be able to, to track down. And the student never came forward saying, yeah, I was the one that, that brought this up. But so the student was saying, you know, I just, I don't get it. Like I, th this still, I don't know how you did this. And I, st I don't understand this, how it's resistive to, you know, these, these hurricane level winds um, if they were to come into the city. And New York is, has been struck by hurricanes. So, Anyway, um, you know, it, because normally buildings are strongest at their corners and it's the perpendicular winds, winds that strike the building at its faces that cause a greatest strain. But again, this was not a normal building. You had those supports shifted to the center of each side. So Le Mazur had accounted for perpendicular winds, but not the quartering winds. So basically he... Uh, factored in if winds were to hit each of the sides, what that would mean for the building. But also, um, and he had an entire model. So he had this up in um, state of the art at the time. It was uh, at a university in Canada. They had uh, wind testing and they actually built a small scale of New York City, which, you know, the buildings that were proximal to this. So how the buildings near the uh, the city corp center would actually affect it, how they would influence the wind patterns. And so I mean, it was very thought out, it was very elaborate. So Le Mazur was really doing his his work with getting all of the information. But this this pestered him, right? He's he's hearing this from the student. He's like, so he goes back and, and he starts to do some digging and he's he talks with his um, engineer team and he said, you know, um, give me the blueprints. I want to go through this again. And, and I, I want to go through what, what was done. And he learns at that point that the remember we talked about these, these V's or these chevrons, these bracings. So those are made to brace the, the building to give it, to give it strength um, to basically to help it from, um, you know, tension from wind and things like that movement from wind. Um, so he said, how, "How those were supposed to be welded, and um, which is the strongest way to to fix those to fix those in to fi make those joints." Well, he learned that they actually were not welded. That Bethlehem Steel, which had the contract for the steel members, which were very strong, um, 
Bethlehem Steel came back and said, you know, there's no need to like do all of this welding. It's going to just set things behind schedule. And we can design a way to bolt this together, um, which will meet the requirements of what Le Mazur had come up with. I was saying, here's, here's how strong the building needs to be for these different stresses, these different wind stresses, plus the stresses, the, the load of what is inside of the building. Um, so they, they actually gave $250,000 back to Citicorp and said, you know, we can design it cheaper and it'll meet all of the standards of your engineer. So they did. So they ended up bolting the building together. Um, so bolting is not as strong as welding. And so that's one step. So, so Le Mazur, he's looking at this and saying, oh, all right. So he's doing his, his calculations. And um, he, he's also meeting again with, with the wind tunnel um, people and, and getting the, the data from when they, they were doing the wind trials. And he's figuring out and he's realizing, you know what? He had never completely accounted for these perpendicular w winds and the quartering winds together. And what he was finding is once you combine these, um, he the velocity winds the building could withstand, okay? Um, basically, it was about a 70-mile-an-hour wind, and, and that was it. That would have been enough, a perpendicular wind and, and, you know, some ricocheting maybe off of some other buildings, but 70 mile an hour wind would have taken this building down. So a return to failure rate is basically when you design a building, how long do you think it'll last before it fails? Um, and he also did the math and determined the rate to failure on this was 16 years. So it was within his lifetime that there would be a 70 mile an hour, you know, wind event, which would take down this, this building because it, the way it was bolted, it would have needed significantly more bolts to put this, to, to gain strength. And so he was panicked, right? He's panicked. Um, so the damper system would largely handle any of the swing, but what if the damper system didn't work? What if the power went out during a hurricane? Um, if that were the case and you didn't have the damper system, yeah, now you, now you have a situation where this tower um, could collapse. Thank you for tuning in to the Safety Doc Podcast with the nation's leading safety expert, Dr. David Perodin, author, radio show host, university instructor, researcher, expert witness, and consultant. Powerful testimonials. Dr. Perodin has a strong reputation as the go-to safety consultant, and he was still able to exceed our expectations. When we went looking for an expert in the field of crisis preparedness and prevention, David was the single person we pursued. Not easy stepping into the touchier subjects of life, but Dr. David pulls it off. Take a listen. Now, back to Dr. David Perodin and the Safety Doc Podcast. So here's what happened. So, Le Mazur went to um, the city court um, president. He also went to his insurance carrier, his liability carrier. He went um, to the New York City um, planning department and with the mayor and conveyed what was going on. He said, listen, like, here's what I've done. They actually brought in uh, two other engineers. One was the um, engineer who had constructed the World Trade Center, so was very familiar with New York City and the perpendicular winds and everything. And, and Le Mazur said, I, I didn't calculate for this. Like, no one calculates for this specific combination of winds in the billing. Acts very peculiar under these circumstances. Even to the when he gave his presentation in 1997, 20 years later, basically, than when he built it. And he, he has since, he, he died, I think about 10 years ago. But even at that time, he said, I still don't have this figured out exactly why this happened. 
all these second, third order things of why, you know, one thing happens and it has a ripple effect of another thing and then that causes five other things to happen and so forth. So he meets with everybody and he said, listen, if we get a 70 mile an hour, you know, wind on this building, it could collapse. And if it collapses, it could, you know, have damage within, um, you know, a, a several block area. So every block was 200 um I believe he said 200 feet long, and the building was 900 feet tall. So, you know, you could see where if it fell in any direction, you know, you could typically impact, you know, three to four blocks. So what they did, all right, is they decided they were not going to make this um, public that this problem existed. So, and the reason they justified that was they said this would this would cause such a disruption it would panic so many people that we're just not going to do it. We figure we would have enough time. And they hired three different weather forecasting agencies. They were monitoring, you know, almost by the minute the weather. Um, they would have enough time if there was a storm approaching that they could evacuate a 10 block radius. Okay, this would they would put this evacuation plan in place. So the New York Police Department would be informed of it. They would have 2,500 Red Cross volunteers on standby, and and they would do this. They would evacuate this 10-block radius. But the people in this 10-block radius, the people in the City Corp Tower, were not aware that this was going on. They had no idea that this contingency plan was in place. So it was all it all happened in secret. And... So what was happening is Le Mazur, um said, I have a solution to this. Okay, we can take uh, metal plates, which will be two inches thick by like six feet long, and we can weld them over all of these connections. And actually, the way the building was put together, it was very easy to get to these internally. They would do it at night. Um, and they had a cover story. Okay, so he came up with a cover story. And the cover story was that by doing this enhancement to the building, they would make it sturdy to withstand a 1,000 year storm at very minimal cost. You know, we're going to come in and, and do this right now. And the media started to get curious. So he received a call from the New York Times. I think it was like five, you know, 5.15 or something. And he didn't return the call until 6.01 p.m. So 46 minutes later, he returns the call. First, he calls his lawyer and he said, do I have to respond to them? And the lawyer said, well, yeah, you've got to. And you've got to be as convincing as you can, because if you don't respond to them, they're just going to keep digging. And, you know, it's kind of not normal to retrofit a building that you've just put up a year, you know, previous with a couple million dollars, you know, in upgrades. Uh, why wasn't that done at the time of construction? So he calls the New York Times and a voicemail thing picks up. Back then, you know, it was all tape. And it said, the New York Times is on strike. And all of the major media, the newspapers were on strike, um, effective six o'clock in New York. So he lucked out. Uh, the story, no, nobody was digging into it. And back then, as he said, the TV um, reporters largely just echoed what was coming out from the newspaper journalist. I mean, they were the people digging in and and getting these stories, not like it is today. But um, so he lucked out. That was on his side. And then he was prioritizing which joints, which areas should be addressed first. So everything was going okay until they got to Labor Day weekend. And the Hurricane Ella was starting to come up the eastern seaboard. And there was a chance if it would have come up the Hudson and kind of hit the... Um, the structure from the uh, westward angle, uh, especially if the dampening system would have failed, that the building could have tumbled. Okay, so very nervous moments, but ultimately Hurricane Ella went out to sea and never had a problem with it. So the public, the building's occupants, they were never notified as Hurricane Ella was starting to bear down on the eastern seaboard, you know, that, hey, you know, like, we could be issuing an evacuation. Um, nope, no one was ever, ever made aware of that. So the story remained a secret until writer Joe 
Morgestern overheard it being told at a party and interviewed Le Mazur. Morgestern broke the story in The New Yorker in 1995. And then after that, Le Mazur in 1997 had given a presentation um, at a university. It is on Google. It's about an hour and seven minutes long, I think. And, and then he's very honest, you know, with the story. But he does say, you know, for like eight to 15 years, he had to be very quiet about it. And there were certain professional groups he talked to about this, but nothing was recorded. Um, and, you know, nothing came public. And it, But also, interesting, um, he talked about in settling this, uh, basically the cost of the $2 million to do this, this retrofit to fortify the building and, and solve the problem then, um, he paid for out of his insurance settlement and then one of his partners. Uh, so they paid for it and there weren't any lawyers involved. And, and I mean, basically it was coming out of the, the um, insurer was paying for this. So um, absolutely, uh, absolutely incredible. So he, you know, he, he also talked about uh, his insurance company approached him and, and said, you know, we're going to have to raise your premiums after this because of, you know, this flaw. And w one of his, um, I believe, attorneys flew out there or, you know, one representative, uh, a substantial, you know, person in his office flew out, met with the insurance carrier and said, listen, listen, like, no, you should not raise our insurance rates because one, like nobody was calculating for, you know, these types of perpendicular, um, you know, dynamic wind configurations. Like if we looked at a standard of what were peers doing at that time, nobody was doing this. So it would be very difficult in court to claim negligence that something was overlooked that would have been standard practice by peers. And Missouri said in this 1997 presentation that there are other buildings like skyscrapers, which do have significant issues. Some of those issues were being addressed and some of them weren't, wasn't going to identify which skyscrapers, which cities. I th just think he said like many. <laughs> so that was kind of unsettling, right? Um, so, but he said, uh, so anyway, this, this, this representative said, no, I mean, we were honest about this and we did have a solution and we basically uh, saved you from a liability of this building collapsing and, you know, potentially 10 or 20,000 people losing their lives. So if anything, our rates should be lowered because we were honest and, and we acted upon this information when, you know, when we were informed, I guess, by this undergraduate student. And that's what happened their insurance rates actually went down. Can you imagine something like that today? So we come into ethics. So um, the ethics. So it's unlikely the building was going to collapse. You would have had a combination of the 70 mile an hour winds and a failure of the dampening system. So you, you could have brought in additional, you know, um, generators to keep the electricity going you did have the plan to evacuate. You did have this very intense weather forecast system with three different agencies watching. Um, but it's a question of ethics. Like, you didn't tell many people what was going on. You know, you, you told uh, the heads of city government, uh, the city corp head knew what was going on. Um, the workers were sworn to secrecy of what they were doing. So... Um, just pretty, pretty amazing too that all of this was kept quiet. But then again, this is in an age before social media, and there was that writer strike that played into this. But ethically, was this the right thing to do? Le Mazur says, you know, it was because we didn't want to create a massive panic. We didn't want to terrify everybody. He said we were terrified of trying to remedy this, but we knew we had the remedy. We knew we had the solution. We just needed time. And we did feel that if the worst case scenario were to happen, it, there would be indicators leading up to that and we'd be able to evacuate. But that's a lot of what ifs, right? Um, 
So here's, here's another question that comes up of ethics. So what if a building was constructed in 1985? Let's say another skyscraper is constructed and that um, skyscraper had the identical flaw as the city corp building Um, because the engineers that that did it uh, were not taking into consideration this wind shear or the shearing forces, um, you know, where winds are coming from, you know, two different directions onto the building. So you look at that and say, what if something would have been built in 19? And maybe something was, right? Maybe that's what Lay Missouri is really saying. You know, maybe there were a number of buildings that were built because the engineers weren't informed of this. They weren't looking for this. So wouldn't you have an obligation to share that information to make sure that nobody built a building with that same fatal flaw in it? Because if they did and that building collapsed, wouldn't you be culpable at some level because you had this knowledge and you knew how hard this was to detect because it wasn't part of standard operating procedure to go through this set of diagnostics. So you held this information for a long time. So, but what do we see right now? Um, What do we see right now in France, right? We see, I believe, a, a withholding of information, of understanding the toxic impact on a large number of people for the the vaporized lead with Notre Dame. But again, at what point does this come out? Do we hear 10 years from now? Yeah, the health department in France and Paris, extremely cognizant of what was going on. We're taking all these samples behind the scenes. We're trying to, you know, identify what could be abatement situations, but also like, what do we do if a million people have, you know, significant levels of lead. What do we do for that? So instead, like, do we just let it ride out and see how it goes and does it improve on its own or what? I mean, there gets to be almost a too big to fail point, but almost too big to remedy point. And is it something where if that becomes public knowledge, does it basically economically wipe out our country? So I think the question with with the C Corp situation um, is amazing from an ethical standpoint of, of just not letting people know of that risk of that building. Um, because, you know, again, what if there were other weaknesses in that, in that building um, that just weren't accounted for? I, I guess that's another part that, that I wonder. But again, Le Mazur said he did like the full you know, work up on it and he just identified it was, it was with these, these sheer winds, which would, you know, crumble it if they were 70 miles an hour. And then how much warning do you really have if a thunderstorm, you know, strikes up? Because this was in summer, they took this on, this project um, of, of remedying this building. And they had to get people from uh, wellers, like from a hundred miles away, like they were soaking up all the wellers to work on this, this building. But, um, you know, something could develop really rapidly. And then you're trying to evacuate people like during the middle of a storm and um, just just amazing. So ethically, you know, should you have shut down the uh, radius around this as you repaired this building and dedicate the resources and been more transparent on that? So, but at the same time, you know, how much of this happens today where this information, if this was made public, Um, that it would have such a devastating effect on a population, such a paralyzing effect that it would basically immobilize um, a project or a a city. So what are the trade-offs in these things? So, hey, you know, we apply everything to school safety. So let's apply this to school safety. So if you were aware of problems, what are the considerations you'd have? So let's say school safety. As a school administrator, you learn that your public address system isn't heard throughout the building. So in, in one-year schools or in a few-year schools, okay? Um, B, principals at some of the schools are months behind on their safety drills. So you say, where are you with your drills? Turn this in, and they're, it's site-based management. They're like, one person's compliant, and the others are like, we've only had one fire drill, and it's April. Um, and we should have had, you know, five by now or whatever. 
Or you find out that your middle school handbook, the content in it on reporting threats um, is written at a 12th grade plus level. So what do you do for these things? So immediately, so like, I, you know, if your principals at some of your buildings are months behind on safety drills, I think your obligation is you have to have your drills. You have to, you have to bring fidelity up to your drills like right now. Like you need to schedule out your drills this this week, okay? They need to happen. And then I need to see, you know, when the when your other drills are being held. Like we immediately have to get on top of that. Um, there's no excuse for that, okay? As far as the public address system being out, here we get into, you know, we've got to allocate money to fixing this problem. Is it part of the billing? Is it antiquated? Does it pay to fix it? Do we replace it? Where do we get the dollars for it? But yeah, it's part of our safety system, right? And if we can't use that, do we have two-way radios where we're notifying people? But that only works to some level because what if you're in a hallway and there is an intruder drill? You need that through public address system. So that needs to come to a school board. But then you have this consideration from the school board of saying, Oh, like, oh, we don't want that information to get out because this is the age of open enrollment. And if people know that we have security problems, safety issues in our school, we might not look as attractive for open enrollment. Remember, this is the age when you don't suspend students, you give them abeyance agreements. It's because suspensions, that's reportable data. And no one is going to transfer into a school or open enroll into a school that has a lot of suspensions. You can accomplish the same thing with using abeyance agreements. It doesn't show up anywhere. That happens, folks. So you you have to own the problems, right? You have to own the problems. So the, the middle school handbook, I think you can, you know, you could remedy that by having your counselors, your, your staff address that and say the next time we, we produce a handbook, we're going to, you know, modify all of these sections so they are accessible to students. So we can do that. But here's what happens. Administrators, they're in their first or second year. They are very nervous to make changes. They're, they're not as confident as uh, Le Mazur coming forward and saying, listen, here are some significant problems. And like if our public address system isn't working um, and we need to do an intruder announcement, not everybody's going to hear it. So we need to fix this. So, you know, do you do it then overtly and make this, you know, aware that your system's not working or is this just part of a maintenance thing or does it get reprioritized? How many people do you want to make aware of that? What kind of headline do you want in the paper on that? Um, what if you don't have the funds to pay for that? Well, you'd, you'd have to find them somewhere. You'd have to reallocate. But it's not that easy in schools because things have certain accounts and you can't reallocate out of certain accounts by the state laws and stuff like that. So these are all really tricky things. And ultimately, like, do you go to your, your school board saying, we need to do a referendum for safety stuff and here's what we need to put out to the public. So some interesting things. Um, thank you so much for listening to the Safety Doc Podcast. This has been the Safety Doc Podcast with author, radio show host, and leading safety expert, Dr. David Perodin. Remember to check back each week for the latest, best, and most bizarre practices in safety preparation and crisis response. You can find Dr. Perodin on Twitter at SafetyPhD. And remember, the truth will keep you safe. A must-read for parents, teachers, and taxpayers. Dr. David Perodin has written the most honest book about the $3 billion school safety industrial complex. Attorney James Sibley proclaims, A brave demonstration of speaking truth to power. School of Errors rips the lid off the billion-dollar school safety industry. Using real-world examples of successful responses in desperate situations, David contrasts the expensive window dressings pitched to panic parents 
with the inexpensive and effective approaches proven to actually work. Read this book before you let your school waste another precious dollar on meaningless safety theater. Buy the international bestseller, School of Errors, Rethinking School Safety in America, now at Barnes & Noble or Amazon.